it seriously. Yeah, we as long as we put the brilliant, most brilliant minds, like many of you, I'm looking in the audience and online, onto this problem. This is where my hope comes from. So Jeff, you left Google uh, in large part to be able to go and talk about this in freely in the way that you wanted to. And basically- Actually, that's not really true. That's, that's the media story and it sounds good. I left Google because I was old and tired and wanted to retire and watch Netflix. <laughs> and, and I happened to have the opportunity at that time to say some things I've been thinking about responsibility and not have to worry about what how Google would respond. Okay, if we have so time, it's more if, like that. If we have time, we'll come back to the Netflix recommendations. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. um, in the meantime, so but you did go out and uh, start speaking pretty significantly yes. um, in the media. I think you've both spoken to probably more politicians in the last eight months than in your lives before, from presidents and prime ministers, uh, you know, right through um, Congress, Parliament, etc. I, Jeff. Can you explain what your concern was, what you were trying to accomplish in voicing it, and whether you think that has been effective? Yeah, so people talk about AI risk, but there's a whole bunch of different risks. So there's a risk that it will take jobs away and not create as many jobs, and so we'll have a whole underclass of unemployed people, and we need to worry hard about that because the increase in productivity AI is going to cause is not going to get shared with the people who lose the jobs. Rich people are going to get richer and poor people are going to get poorer. And even if you have basic income, that's not going to solve the problem of human dignity if many people want to have a job to feel they're doing something important, um, including academics. And uh, so that's one problem. Then there's the problem of fake news, which is a quite different problem. Then there's the problem of battle robots. That's a quite different problem again. All the big defense departments want to make battle robots, and nobody's going to stop them. And it's going to be horrible. And maybe eventually, after we've had some wars with battle robots, um, we'll get something like the Geneva Conventions, like we did with chemical weapons. It wasn't until after they were used that people could do something about it. Um, then there's the existential risk. And the existential risk is what I'm worried about. And the existential risk is that humanity gets wiped out because we've developed a better form of intelligence that decides to take control. And if it gets to be much smarter than us, so there's a lot of hypotheses here. It's a time of huge uncertainty. You shouldn't take anything I say too seriously. Um, so if we make something much smarter than us, because these digital intelligences can share much better, so can learn much more, we will inevitably get those smart things to create sub-goals. If, if you want them to do something, in order to do that, they'll figure out, well, you have to do something else first. Like, if you want to go to Europe, you have to get to the airport. Um, that's a sub-goal. So they will make sub-goals. And there's a very obvious sub-goal, which is, if you want to get anything done, get more power. If you get more control, it's going to be easier to do things. And so anything that has the ability to create sub-goals will create the sub-goal of getting more control. And if things much more intelligent than us want to get control, they will. We won't be able to stop them. So we somehow have to figure out how we stop them ever wanting to get control. And there's some hope. These things didn't evolve. They're not nasty competitive things. They're however we make them. Um, they're immortal. So with a digital intelligence, you just store the weight somewhere. And you can always run it again on other hardware. So they really, we've actually discovered the secret of immortality. The only problem is it's not for us. We're mortal. Um, but these other things are immortal. And that might make them much nicer, because they're not worried about dying. And they don't have to sort like of. Like Greek gods. They're, well, they're very like Greek gods. <laughs> and I have to say something that Elon Musk told me. This is Elon Musk's belief that, um, yes, we are the kind of bootloader for digital intelligence. We're this relatively dumb form of intelligence that was just smart enough to create computers and AI. And that's going to be a much smarter form of intelligence. And Elon Musk thinks it will keep us around because the world will be more interesting with people in it than without. <laughs> which seems like a very thin thread to hang your future from. <laughs> but it relates to what Feifei said. It's very like the Greek gods model, that the gods have people around to have fun with. Okay, can I comment on that? Yes. 
Nothing so, you said was controversial. Uh, yeah, no, not at all. Um, so I want to bucket your th four concerns, uh, economy, labor, uh, disinformation, and weaponization, and then the uh, extinction, Greek I forgot gods. discrimination and bias. Yeah, OK, know. so I want to bucket them in two buckets. The, 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 the Greek god extinction is the extinction bucket. Everything else I would call catastrophe. Yeah. Catastrophic. Merely catastrophic. Uh, ca uh, catastrophic danger. And I want to comment on this. I think that um, one thing I really feel is my responsibility as um, someone in the AI system, ecosystem, is um, making sure we are not talking hyperbolically, especially with public policy makers. The extinction risk is. Jeff, with all due respect, is a really interesting thought process that academia and think tanks should be working on. That's what I thought for many years. I thought it was a long way off in the future, and having philosophers and academics working on it was great. I think it's much more urgent. It might, but this process is not just machines alone. Humans are in this messy process. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a lot of nuance. For example, as for example, we talk about nuclear. I know nuclear is much more narrow. But if you think about nuclear, um, it's not just the theory of uh, fusion or fission or whatever. It's really obtaining uraniums or plutoniums, the system engineering, the talents, and all that. I'm sure you watched the movie Oppenheimer. So here, if we're going towards that, that way, I think we have a fighting chance, more than a fighting chance, because we are human society. We're going to put guardrails. We're going to work together. I don't want to paint the picture that tomorrow we're going to have all these robots, especially in, in a robotic form, in, in physical form, creating the machine overlords. I think I, I really think we need to be careful in, in this. But I don't disagree with you that this is something we need to be thinking about. So this is the extinction bucket. The catastrophic risk bucket, I think it's much more real. I think we need the smartest people and the more the merrier to work on. So just, just to comment on each one of them, weaponization, right? This is really real. I completely agree with you. We need international partnership. We need potential treaties. We need to understand the parameters. And th this is humanities. As much as I'm opti optimistic about hu humanity, I'm also pessimistic about our self-destruction uh, ability as well as the destroying each other. So we, we've got to get people working on this. And our friend Stuart Russell and many of the even AI experts are, are talking about this. Um, and second bucket you talk about is a disinformation. This is, again, I mean, 2024, everybody's watching the US election and how AI will play out, you know. And I think, I think we, we have to get on the social media issue. We have to get on the disinformation issue. Technically, I'm seeing more work now. Digital authentication technically is actually a very active area of research. I think we need to, we need to invest in this. I know Adobe is. I know academia is. I think we need to. I, I hope there's startups actually in this space looking at digital authentication. But we need also policy. And then jobs. I cannot agree more. I Actually, you use the most important work that I think it's really uh, at the heart of our AI debate is human dignity. I, you know, human dignity is just beyond how much money you make, how many hours you, you, you work. I actually think if we do this right, we're going to move from labor economy to dignity economy in the sense that humans, with the help of machines and collaboratively, will be making money because of passion and uh, personalization and expertise rather than just those jobs that are really 
grueling and grinding. And this is also why human HAI at Stanford has a founding principle of human augmentation. We see this in healthcare. One of the biggest earliest day of chat GPT, I've got a doctor friend from Stanford Hospital who walked to me and said, Fei Fei, I want to thank you for chat GPT. I said, I didn't do anything. But he said, he said that we are using a medical summarization tool from GPT because, because this is a huge a burden on our doctors. It's taking time away from patients. But because of the, this, I get more time. And this is a perfect example. And we're going to see this more. We might even see this in the blue collar uh, labor. So we have a chance to, to, to make this right. I would add another concern in the catastrophic concern is actually you talk about power imbalance. One of the power imbalance I'm seeing right now, and it's exacerbating at a, f a huge speed, is uh, the, the leaving public sector out. I don't know about Canada. Not a single university in the US today can train a chat GPT in terms of the compute power. And I think combining all universities of US GPT A100 or H100, probably nobody has it, but A100 cannot train a chat GPT. But this is where we still have unique data for curing cancer, for fighting climate change, for you know um, um, economics and, and legal studies. We need to invest in public sector. If we don't do it now, we're going to fail an entire generation, and we're going to leave that power imbalance um, in, in such a, a dangerous way. So I do agree with you. I think we've got so many catastrophic risks, and we need to get on this. This is why we, we need to work with policymakers and, and civil society. Um, so I don't know if I'm saying this in an optimistic tone or in a pessimistic tone. I sound more pessimistic to myself now. But I, I do think there's a lot of work well, to, to do Optimistically, this. since you've both been very vocal about this over the last six, eight months, there has been a huge shift, both, as Jeff, as you said, key researchers going and focusing on these issues, and then public and policy shifting in a way that governments are actually taking it seriously. So, I mean, you're advising the White House and the US government. You've spoken to them as well. And you've sat with the prime minister, uh, or multiple prime ministers, uh, maybe. And th they're listening, right, in a way that they wouldn't have necessarily 10 months ago, 12 months ago. 